I, he figured out the equation for a black hole and this was something that he we didn't have it nasa wasn't even invented but this man thought of this these were downloads these were etheric downloads tapping into the akasha do you hear yourself when you talk <laughs> Hey everyone, JL here, and welcome back to Bridge the Divide, where I examine irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that follow, and how we, with education, rationality, and reason, can bridge the societal divides that they create. All of you seem to really enjoy my last video, where I debunked the TikTok psychedelic enthusiast and anti-government conspiracy theorist, Marco Nopolo. So you'll be pleased to know that this Kung Wu master is back, and he's got five conspiracies that he asserts turned out to be true. So so that means we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's dive right in and see just how deep Marco's rabbit holes really go. A lot of us are familiar with the popular Netflix series Stranger Things, but what a lot of people don't realize is that this show was based off of true events. It's based off the Montauk Project where the government would kidnap and experiment on psychic children. So yes, demigorgons, they're real, and I'll touch more on that in a second. There's a base on Long Island where the US government conducted experiments that included mind control, telekinesis time travel and teleportation. They would put kids in a chair that would enhance the psychic abilities of those who sat in it. Some were able to open portals to other dimensions. One of the kids had the ability to manifest objects with his mind using this device. He was able to materialize a monstrous beast out of his subconscious mind. The project came to an end immediately after this incident. In July 2008, an unidentifiable creature washed up on the shores of Montauk. Some believe it was the body of a raccoon or dog. Others believe it was part of an experiment from the nearby Plum Island, which has a restricted government lab that studies diseased animals. It's believed that this is where Lyme disease originated from, and I'll cover that in another video. I actually covered this conspiracy on the first video I did on Marco, so we don't really need to go into extreme detail on that again. Suffice to say, the Montauk Conspiracy's roots are in a series of sci-fi books written by Preston Nichols and Peter Moon back in 1992. And the Duffer Brothers, creators of Stranger Things, cited the books as inspirations for their show. They even sold the project to Netflix under the working title Montauk. And while conspiracy theorists can hide all day long behind the assertion that all of the relevant records were hidden or destroyed, this conspiracy ultimately fails because of the logical entailments. The Montauk Project series is predominantly about experiments in time travel. And in the book series, the characters go back in time to deliberately cause massive changes to major historical events such as the American Civil War and World War II. But of course, this sets up a variation of what is known as the grandfather paradox. That if you invent time travel specifically to change a particular event in the past, then by eliminating the event from ever occurring, you also eliminate your reason for ever inventing time travel in the first place. And as for the Montauk talk monster that was forensically identified by paleozoologist Darren Nash as the water degraded corpse of a raccoon. Well that's the first one down, let's see what Marco has next for us. Was Lyme disease a man-made virus? If you're into conspiracy theories, this one's pretty interesting. And to understand this theory, we have to go back to the end of World War II, when the United States secretly recruited Nazi scientists to help with America's security interests. They wanted to create a biological weapon using insects. So they recruited top Nazi scientist Erich Traub, a German veterinary and virologist who specialized in hand, foot, and mouth disease. He was sent to Plum Island to work with the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. In 1969, it was transferred over to the U.S. Department of Agriculture for its current use. Some claimed that a man-made strain of Borrelia burgdorferi escaped the laboratory on Plum Island. It was discovered in 1975 in the town of Lyme, Connecticut, which isn't too far from Plum Island. Scientists claim they kill animals here to prevent the spread of diseases. Strange creatures wash up on the nearby shores of Plum Island. No one truly knows what goes on at this facility. But I'm curious to know, what do you all think? First of all, Lyme disease is not caused by a virus. Lyme disease is caused by the Borrelia bacterium and is spread by ticks in the genus Ixodes. The recognizable name does come from the towns Lyme and Old Lyme in Connecticut, where in 1975, a cluster of cases originally thought to be juvenile rheumatoid arthritis was identified. Further symptom examination, however, revealed these cases to be the arthritic presentation of Lyme disease. It is, however, in a cursory look at the evidence that this conspiracy 
quickly falls apart. We'll start that look with what Marco has asserted. The disease caused by the Borrelia bacterium was popularly named Lyme disease after the Connecticut case cluster in 1975. And the Plum Island Animal Disease Center was established by the USDA on Plum Island, New York in 1954. However, biologists studying the phylogeography of the bacterium discovered that it has existed in Northeast America since pre-colonial times. A link to that 2009 article is in the description. These findings are supported by the earliest accounts of what we now know to be both descriptions of the disease and its vectors, which date back to the 1600s. In his descriptions of visiting New England, 17th century English traveler John Jocelyn wrote, there be infinite numbers of ticks hanging upon the bushes in summertime that will cleave to man's garments and creep into his breeches, eating themselves in a short time into the very flesh of a man. I have seen the stockings of those that have gone through the woods covered with them. Swedish botanist Peter Kalm also confirmed this in 1749 when he was sent to America by Carl Linnaeus. He reported that the forests of New York were abound with ticks, but the first detailed medical description of what is now known as Lyme disease is attributed to Scottish minister and historian John Walker. Walker visited the island of Jura off the coast of Scotland in 1764. There he gives detailed reports of both the tick vector and of the symptoms of Lyme disease. Preserved Borrelia bacterium has also been found in German museum specimens dating back to 1884. And a 2010 autopsy of Utzi the Iceman, a 5,300-year-old mummy, revealed the presence of the DNA sequence of Borrelia, making Utzi the earliest known human being with Lyme disease. And most recently, genomic research on Borrelia conducted at Yale in 2017 revealed that the bacterium existed in North America at least 60,000 years ago, meaning the disease has been prevalent in North America since before humans first crossed the Bering Strait. And it was merely the combination of deforestation, suburbanization, and explosions in the deer population that led to Lyme disease's proliferation across the continent. So from the evidence, we can see that the government was demonstrably not responsible for Lyme disease. That makes Marco 0 for 2. Let's see what he's got next. Let's talk about MK Ultra. This was a secret CIA brainwashing program that started in the 1950s. The CIA successfully figured out how to master the art of mind control. They experimented on sex workers, prisoners, people with terminal illness, and foster children. Many of the subjects had no idea that they were even part of this experiment. They would hypnotize and load these subjects with LSD to see the effects that they had on the mind. They would also torture these subjects nearly to death, which led to trauma-based mind controlling. They figured out that you could fracture a subject's mind so that they would have a split personality disorder. Then they would insert a new mind into the void. They could program you to be an assassin. This was their main objective. They wanted to control people who could kill on command. It's noted that this is why the Manson murders occurred. Charles Manson was at the same prison that they targeted for MK Ultra. Subjects would commit these acts of murder and have no memory or moral compass of what occurred. It's noted that there are many celebrities who are under the influence of MKUltra. What's even more crazy is that the CIA tried to destroy every document pertaining to MKUltra. The only reason we know about it is because of the information that was accidentally found on financial documents as well as eyewitness accounts. Whoa, that is a lot to unpack regarding Project MKUltra. First off, let's start by getting a quick handle on what exactly Project MKUltra was. MKUltra was the codename for an illegal human experimentation program undertaken by the CIA at the height of the Cold War. Fearing that brainwashing techniques were being used on American POWs by Soviet, Chinese, and North Korean agents, the United States government decided to conduct its own experimentation program. The roots of MKUltra were developed in 1951 with the drug-related interrogation experiments Projects Bluebird and Artichoke. MKUltra itself was officially started in 1953, reduced in scope in 1964 and 1967, and ultimately terminated in 1973. The experiments were initially intended to develop procedures and identify drugs that could be useful in interrogations by weakening individuals and forcing confessions through brainwashing techniques and psychological torture. Using front organizations, experiments were conducted by the CIA at more than 80 institutions. These included universities, hospitals, prisons, psych wards, and pharmaceutical companies. 
And while many of the subjects of the experiments either had no idea what they were consenting to or gave no consent at all, there were no records that any experiments were ever done on children or in state foster facilities in any capacity. Furthermore, none of the MK Ultra whistleblowers reported that children were being experimented on during the investigative aftermath of MK Ultra or during the Senate hearings. As far as I can tell, Marco was just lifting this part from the fictional Montauk books. However, it was revealed that many forms of torture were implemented on subjects, including electroshocks, sensory deprivation, sexual abuse, and the covert dosing of subjects with high quantities of psychedelic drugs, including, but not limited to, LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, and mescaline, often with limited or no consent. MKUltra was first brought to public attention in 1975, thanks in part to President Gerald Ford's Rockefeller Commission. This commission led to investigations into the conduct of the CIA, and a 1977 FOIA request uncovered some 20,000 MKUltra documents, which then led to the Senate hearings. There were also a number of surviving documents declassified in July of 2001. Ultimately, however, However, as noted in the recovered documentation, the results of the experiments were deemed unscientific, unreliable, and offered no legitimate use in any interrogation or intelligence gathering scenario. At most, the experiments and their cultural impact probably inspired the hippie generation and were a stark reminder of what we were supposed to have learned at the Nuremberg trials. And Marco's claims about manufacturing assassins or creating sleeper agents is pure fiction, taken directly from Richard Condon's novel The Manchurian Candidate. Another major problem with this conspiracy is the lack of supportive evidence and some conflicting timelines when it comes to certain events. Regarding Charles Manson, the notorious cult leader was never incarcerated at any of the prisons where MK Ultra experiments took place. In fact, during most of the prison experiments, Manson was actually on the run from a bench warrant before he was arrested, taken back to California, and then transferred to McNeil Island, Washington. And as revealed in the documentation, there were no experiments conducted at McNeil or at Terminal Island where Manson was incarcerated twice. And while some experiments were conducted in the San Quentin psych ward, Manson himself wouldn't arrive at San Quentin until 1971, after the infamous Manson murders. And his time in Haight-Ashbury during the height of the counterculture movement in 1967, as well as being involved in Roger Smith's LSD study at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, has been deemed purely coincidental by Manson researchers. In fact, virtually everything Marco is asserting here about Manson and the Tate-LaBianca murders is taken from Tom O'Neill's book, Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s. And Marco conveniently ignores the fact that a critical analysis of the book reveals it to be rife with wild assumptions and meritless claims based on scant evidence. A lurid story that's nothing more than a lot of enormous leaps between major events with no common denominator other than the decade that they took place in. Also, as revealed by the court transcripts, the perpetrators of the Tate-LaBianca murders all remembered what they had done, so Marco just made that part of himself. And Manson's defense team never submitted anything into evidence regarding the LSD experiments in Haight-Ashbury as a possible cause for the crime, despite the well-documented psychological effects of the experiments on the cult leader. And lastly, as far as celebrities being under the influence of MKUltra, this one took a little bit of investigative work on my part. Apparently, Back in 2019, there were a series of meme videos that hit the internet that showed celebrities such as Cardi B, Al Roker, and Shaquille O'Neal caught on camera in weird moments. And the claims were made that they were under the effects of mind control and that their behavior was a result of glitches in their MK Ultra programming. The meme videos were quickly covered by Ebombs World, found a home in the bowels of Reddit, and can now be found scattered across YouTube. And of course, while Marco is obviously ignoring the comedy side to the story, he also ignores the fact that looking through old footage of celebrities to find odd behavior in order to confirm a prior-held suspicion about that behavior is nothing more than confirmation bias. Whew! MK Ultra always appears to go really, really deep, but once critically examined, we can see that it's really only used to push anti-government ideologies, especially in fringe groups looking for any reason to justify being anti-government. Marco is now 0-3. Let's hope this next one is especially wild. This is a conspiracy theory that turned out to be true. Weather modification. Please be cloud seeding, please be cloud seeding. 
A lot of people don't realize this, but our government can in fact control the weather. And they have been doing this since the Vietnam War. Do y'all remember the scene in Forrest Gump where he said one day it just started raining and it didn't quit for four months? Well, that was because Operation Popeye. Oh, sorry, wrong picture. Operation Popeye was a highly classified attempt to increase the monsoon season over Vietnam. They polluted the clouds with silver and lead iodine to increase the rainfall. Operation Popeye was sponsored by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, the CIA, and the U.S. taxpayers. U.S. taxpayers paid over $3.6 million for an operation they had no idea they were even funding. Essentially, the U.S. tried to play the role of Mother Nature to slow down the Vietnamese through weather modification. And still lost. Eventually, the federal government would declassify its Popeye documents. The United Nations set laws that prohibited any country from altering the weather. But we all know they're still doing it. So first and foremost, cloud seeding is not a conspiracy. Efforts to induce or restrict rainfall through weather manipulation have been an interest to humans since the late 1800s. Also, there were concerns about what the scientific community would think about altering the weather to such a degree in Vietnam. But they were ignored under the excuse of national security, and Operation Popeye commenced in 1967 and ended in 1972. And given the increase in war journalism at the time, the operation was quickly found out and everything about it was revealed to the American public. And yes, in the end, the efforts to affect the monsoon season and disrupt the North Vietnamese army were unsuccessful. But there is, of course, no conspiracy here. Operation Popeye was a classified military operation, one of thousands going on at the time, and it was quickly found out after it began. So it appears that Marco is just using this story in a weak attempt to give credibility to the chemtrails conspiracy that came to life in 1996, all the while ignoring the fact that that conspiracy was officially debunked by the Carnegie Institute for Science in 2016. Once again, Marco is just fostering antisocial and anti-government ideologies. Because our Kung Wu master here really doesn't like the idea that he can't walk around doing whatever he wants under the influence of any drugs he wants whenever the hell he wants. So now you're 0-4, Marco. Let's hope his last one is his best. Are oil companies purposely suppressing technology for greed? With oil being a dwelling resource, the fear of it reaching a peak continues to haunt the oil industry. Marco, a dwelling is a place you inhabit. The word you're looking for is dwindling. Dwindling, meaning running out of. Something your recreational supply is obviously not. One would imagine that someone would have came up with an alternative solution by now. What's interesting is the ones who do usually end up dead. Stan Meyer successfully invented a car that was fueled by water. He ended up being sued by the oil industry and mysteriously died not too much longer afterwards. Tom Ogle created a system that did away with the car's carburetor so that the car can only run on fumes. This resulted in fuel efficiency up to 100 miles per gallon as well as less pollution from the engine exhaust. He took a car full of scientists from El Paso, Texas to Demon, New Mexico with only two gallons. If you're not familiar with this trip, this is over 100 miles. When he tried to patent this concept, he was sued by General Motors. They claimed they had something similar to this but weren't putting it on the market. Instead of making millions, Tom Ogle ended up broke. In 1981, he was found dead. The cause of death was suicide. The mystery surrounding his death makes many people wonder. Okay, so this is the free energy suppression conspiracy theory. It asserts that technologically viable, pollution-free, no-cost energy sources are being suppressed by the government or corporations. This purported technology includes perpetual motion machines, cold fusion generators, Taurus-based generators, anti-gravity propulsion, and, just because it can, reverse-engineered alien technology. Usually it's the fossil fuel industry or the nuclear industry that's credited as being behind these efforts. The first example Marco brings up is American inventor Stanley Meyer and his infamous water fuel cell. Without getting too technical, Stanley essentially claimed that he had invented a perpetual motion machine. A machine that by definition violates the law of conservation of energy. Furthermore, Stanley went above and beyond to avoid peer review for his revolutionary device. And Stanley was never sued by the oil industry. That's a claim that doesn't even make sense because Stanley didn't use anything in his invention that the oil industry could lay legal claim to. It actually would have made more sense to claim that the automotive industry sued Stanley. But that wouldn't work either because the patent for the internal combustion engine, which was the basis for Stanley's invention, entered the public domain in 1927. Stanley was actually sued in 1996 by two investors that he had sold water fuel technologies dealer 
dealerships to. As a result, Stanley was required by the court to submit his invention for expert review in the case. And while he initially did everything he could to hold off that examination, it eventually took place. And the three court-appointed experts found that his water fuel cell was nothing more than a conventional electrolysis system. Meyer was found guilty of gross and egregious fraud and ordered to repay the investors their combined $50,000. Meyer, who had long suffered from high blood pressure, died two years later from a cerebral aneurysm while dining with two Belgian investors. As of today, Meyer's water fuel cell patent has expired and is now in the public domain. As for the second story Marco brought up, it involves the young El Paso inventor, Tom Ogle. Ogle claimed that he had created a fuel system that could deliver 100 miles to the gallon, and he apparently did it by removing the vehicle's carburetor. The vehicle in question was his own 1970 Ford Galaxy. Supposedly using only two gallons of gas, Tom drove a reporter from the El Paso Times from El Paso to Deming, New Mexico and back, a distance of roughly 204 miles. The problems for Tom came after the fact when his system came under critical examination. He refused to do another demonstration when challenged by Robert Levy, PhD in physics, despite being offered $1,000 to do so. He later claimed that the system had been dismantled and would be too expensive to reassemble. He later encountered patent conflicts with General Motors, who filed an injunction against him and the company he sold the idea to. He also had problems with shady investment partners, extravagant spending habits, and generally poor business decisions that ultimately screwed him out of the royalties he would have been paid. It would be around this time that it was reported that Ogle was suffering from severe depression. That depression would lead him to start gambling. Unfortunately, he incurred heavy losses, which only further exacerbated his condition, which in turn worsened his already heavy drinking and tranquilizer abuse habits, as confirmed by his mother. And then one night, while avoiding an angry investor, a broke and severely depressed Tom Ogle turned up at the Smuggler's Inn bar for a night of drinking. Until one night, while avoiding an angry investor, a broke and severely depressed Tom Ogle turned up at the Smuggler's Inn bar for a usual night of drinking. Several hours later, at the age of 26, he would collapse and die from the toxic combination of alcohol and the tranquilizer Darvon. Tom's official cause of death was ruled accidental overdose slash suicide, as the medical examiner could not rule out his chronic depression as a comorbidity factor. So unfortunately for Marco, there is no mystery surrounding Tom Ogle's death. It was the result of a well-understood series of tragic events as verified by the witnesses in Tom's life. And on a more personal note, I find it rather disgusting that conspiracy theorists like Marco here will use the tragic events of these two individuals' lives as props to further their antisocial ideologies. This also makes Marco 0 for 5 in the conspiracy department. But I have a sneaking suspicion that it will take more than two debunking videos to keep this Kung Wu master down. I have no doubt that I'll be covering his attempts to spread his antisocial and anti-government sentiment again soon. Regardless, his legend will certainly continue, if only in his own mind. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please like, share, and subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. And be sure to leave a comment below. I love reading your responses, and those interactions help with the dreaded algorithm. Don't forget, July is National HIV Awareness Month. A link on how you can help these efforts is down in the description. And if you love scary movies, be sure to check out me and my filmmaker friends over at the Week in Horror podcast, now in our third season. Everything you need to become a channel member here, get yourself some official Bridge the Divide swag, or support the podcast are down in the description below. Once again, thank you all so much for your continued support. And as always, be safe, be excellent to each other. And together, we can Bridge the Divide. Thank you.